Machines require engines for them to work. No matter how smart and innovative a machine might be, if it does not have power, it will not work. But if engines are so important, how come we rarely see them in documentaries and videos? Yes, the building of the machine is recorded, but have you ever wondered how they built an engine? Hello and welcome back to Lord Gizmo. In today's video, we'll get to know the process behind the building of an engine. This will not only feature any engine, but a powerful one. Today, we'll see how the 13,600 horsepower engine was built. Be prepared to get blown away by their power, efficiency, and productivity. But before that, please don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button for more videos like these. As much as we want you to learn about how an engine is built right away, it's important that you learn about the basics of it first. In the first part of the video, we'll talk about what an engine is, some of its parts, and the general process of building one. What are engines? Now, engines are those boxes that we see inside machines. They're seen as the heart of a machine because of its responsibility for converting energy fuel into mechanical energy. Once it does this, motion is created too. In other words, an engine is a sophisticated device made to shift the heat from burning gas into the force that turns the wheels of a vehicle. A spark ignites a mixture of compressed air and gasoline vapor inside of a temporarily sealed cylinder and causes it to burn quickly, starting the series of reactions that leads to the goal. Because of this, the device is known as an internal combustion engine. As the mixture burns, it expands, giving the car power to move. Engines are referred to as heat engines in thermodynamics because they transform heat energy into macroscopic motion. The burning of fuel inside the engine releases heat energy, which drives the pistons up and down. The vehicle, or other apparatus, is then propelled by the rotational energy created by this movement. Other alternative fuel types that can be utilized to power engines includes biofuels and natural gas. Compared to conventional fossil fuels, these fuels provide a number of benefits, such as less greenhouse gas emissions and increased sustainability. Currently, the most common type of engine on the market is the internal combustion engine. This is the counterpart of an external combustion engine. If you have no idea what those two are, let's define them first. Number 1. Internal Combustion Engine These types of engines are most commonly used in vehicles, boats, ships, airplanes, and trains. It's called as such because the ignition of the fuel and its other processes, even with the expanding gases moving pistons, are done inside the engine. Energy is converted into macroscopic motion by internal combustion engines, such as reciprocating and rotary engines. While the rotary engine employs a spinning triangle rotor to transform heat from combustion into usable work, the reciprocating engine uses pistons to transfer pressure from expanding gases into rotational motion. Both gasoline and diesel fuels are compatible with these engines. In a gasoline engine, a spark from a spark plug ignites an air and fuel mixture, enabling the gas to heat up and expand, and move the pistons. Diesel engines, on the other hand, ignite the mixture by compression. For a vehicle to operate effectively, both sorts of engines are required. Number 2. External Combustion Engines If an internal combustion engine uses the same heat source and fluid in its process, the external combustion machines, on the other hand, use a heat source that is separate from the fluid that does the work. Many power plant designs employ the external combustion engine. Can-do reactors, co-filed power plants, natural gas power plants, solar thermal power plants, and steam trains are a few examples of these engines. Parts of an engine Engines, just like any other machine would, have different parts that come together in order to generate power. Getting acquainted with these parts is the first step in wanting to learn how it's built. Of course, you can't build an engine if you don't know which part goes where. Different vehicles will sometimes require different engines too. In this video, we'll focus more on the four main car engine parts. Besides, the mechanism behind these are just the same with most of the engines. Here are some of the important parts. Number 1. Engine Block and Cylinders The foundation of a car's engine is the engine block, which is frequently built of iron or aluminum. It has three fixed sections, the cylinder head, the block, and the crankcase, and practically all of the engine's essential parts, including the pistons, the crankshaft, and the connecting rods, are housed within. Its peripherations house the cylinders, 
which are made up of 4 to 16 metal tubes, depending on the kind of vehicle and whose diameter determines the engine displacement. Where the piston rotates as the fuel burns, the crucial coolant and oil flow pathways, which are needed for cooling and lubrication, are located in some additional engine holes. Number 2. Pistons When we talk about pistons, these are the moving discs that are enclosed in a cylinder. This cylinder is made gas tight by piston rings. Once the disc is inside, it will move as a liquid or gas inside the cylinder expands and contracts. The conversion of heat energy into mechanical work and vice versa is facilitated by a piston. Pistons are a crucial part of heat engines as a result. The work of pistons is seen when they need to transfer the force output of an expanding gas in the cylinder to a crankshaft. This then provides the flywheel with the rotational momentum. A piston's cyclical process converts heat energy into work. This cycle can be completed by adding heat to the gas inside the cylinder, increasing its volume, and providing work. The gas's pressure decreases, allowing it to be compressed more easily. When the piston is filled with work, it returns to its initial state, completing the cycle. Hence, the system is called a reciprocating engine. Number 3. Crankshaft The crankshaft, which transforms the piston's linear motion into rotary motion, is an essential part of a reciprocating engine. Crank pins, which are attached to the pistons and feature an offset access that enables the conversion of motion, are used to create this motion. In a pump, the piston moves back and forth as a result of the crankshaft's rotation, producing a reciprocating motion that is necessary for the pump to operate properly. Crank pins, which connect the crankshaft to the pistons and convert motion between the two parts, are used in this connection. However, the reciprocating engine's typical four-stroke cycle is not continuous, which can cause pulsations or choppiness in the engine's performance. To address this issue, the crankshaft is often connected to a flywheel, which is used to store rotational energy and smooth out the pulsations in the engine's operation. Number 4. Camshaft Finally, the camshaft acts as the main body of an engine. This part is responsible for making sure that the opening and clothing of the valves are done in the perfect timing. The camshaft does this through pressing the end of the valve stem. This part is very crucial because the absence of it means that the engine will not start. Aside from that, it also has other functions. The camshaft is also responsible for absorbing the rotary motion of the crankshaft. Then, it transfers that back to linear motion, thus ensuring the smooth operation of an engine. How does it work? Putting of all those functions together, an engine can work seamlessly and provide power to whatever machine it's serving. Looking at it now, the mechanism of an engine may appear simple, but that's not always the case. Just like how engines have different types, they also have different functions and different mechanisms of action too. In this video, we'll focus on learning how an internal combustion engine and external combustion engine work. Both engines use the process of combustion or the basic chemical process of releasing energy from a fuel and air mixture. In simpler terms, both engines utilize burning. However, where the process takes place makes each of them unique from each other. Number 1. Internal Combustion Engine In an internal combustion engine ice, the gasoline is ignited and burned inside the engine itself. The energy from the combustion is then partially converted into work by the engine. A stationary cylinder and a moving piston make up the engine. The piston is propelled by the expanding combustion gases, which turns the crankshaft. This motion ultimately propels the wheels of the car through the powertrain's gearing system. The spark ignition gasoline engine and the compression ignition diesel engine are the two types of internal combustion engines currently in production. The majority of these engines have a four-stroke cycle, which requires four piston strokes to complete a cycle, the intake, compression, combustion, and power stroke, and exhaust are the four separate processes that make up the cycle. Let's get to know the two types of internal combustion more. A. Spark ignition gasoline engine an internal combustion engine known as a spark ignition SI engine, which is typically a petrol engine, uses a spark from a spark plug to start the combustion process of an air-fuel mixture. During the intake process of a spark ignition engine, the fuel and air are combined before being introduced into the cylinder. The spark ignites the fuel-air mixture after the piston compresses it, resulting in combustion. During the power stroke, 
The piston is propelled by the expansion of the combustion gases. B. Compression Ignition Diesel Engine Diesel engines run on a process called compression ignition, which intake air and its recirculated exhaust gas are squeezed at high pressure to produce the heat required to ignite diesel fuel, which burns more quickly than gasoline because of its higher density. Spark plugs are used in gas engines to produce heat, whereas compression ignition happens naturally in the combustion chambers. Torque is produced and the rotating assembly is made to move more quickly as a result. Diesel engine fueling has a significant role in performance, with richer fuel supplies producing more torque. While turbocharging increases airflow and boosts performance, significant gains are only possible with better feeding. In conclusion, a crucial aspect of diesel engine performance is compression ignition. Number 2. External Combustion Engine An external combustion engine is a form of heat engine that produces power using an external source of heat. This is different from conventional internal combustion engines, which generate power through a combustion process inside the engine. An external source, such as burning fuel outside the engine, is used in an external combustion engine to heat the working fluid. As a result of this heated fluid expanding, the engine's mechanism moves, creating useful work. To put it simply, an external combustion engine burns fuel outside of the engine. The thermal energy released during fuel combustion is utilized to heat water and convert it to steam. A piston inside a cylinder is moved back and forth by the pressure of the steam. The wheels of a car, a turbine, or another mechanical device could all be turned using the kinetic energy of the moving piston. The possibility of being more ecologically friendly than conventional internal combustion engines is one benefit of external combustion engines. There's less chance of emissions and contamination because the combustion process takes place outside of the engine. Additionally, the use of a fixed quantity of permanently gaseous fluid as a working fluid can reduce the need for cooling systems and increase the efficiency of the engine. Ships and its engines We'll get to know two ships with enormous engines today. Ferry Catamaran by Venezia Lines this is the Catamaran Ferry, first and foremost. Travelers seeking to experience the stunning coastal cities of the Adriatic Sea can currently travel between Italy and Croatia on board the Ferry Catamaran owned by Venezia Lines in a practical and comfortable manner. The Fran Gisks and her sister ship, the San Pal, both of which have a capacity of 310 people, are the two vessels now in service. The ferry service provides a dependable and effective means of transportation between Italy and Croatia. The ferry catamaran travels between Venice, Italy, and the ports of Mali Lazon, Umag, Pula, Porek, Ravinch, Rebek, and Peran, Croatia, depending on the location. The crossing can take anywhere from two to four hours. Travelers can effortlessly organize their vacation and take pleasure in a stress-free journey with such a wide variety of routes and schedules readily available. All passengers will have a comfortable and delightful trip thanks to the sophisticated conveniences and facilities that the ferry catamaran is outfitted with. There are also outdoor decks with breathtaking views of the Adriatic Sea, as well as air-conditioned lounges, restaurants, bars, and restrooms. In order to ensure the safety of all passengers and cargo, the vessels also have cutting-edge safety equipment and skilled crew members. MV Jean de la Vallette, GDLV one of the biggest high-speed catamaran ferries in the world, the MV Jean de la Vallette JDLV is owned and operated by Virtue Ferries. The JDLV, built by Austel in 2010, operated routes from Malta to Pozzolo and Catania in Sicily and acted as a bridge between Malta and the rest of Europe. The ferry served as a practical and effective form of transportation for passengers and freight, with a capacity for 374 passengers and 68 automobiles. The Trinidad and Tobago Inner Island Ferry Service leased the MV St. John Paul II in March 2019 to take the role of the JDLV as an inter-island ferry between Port of Spain and Scarborough for the duration of 2019 to 2021. The JDLV resumed its original route after arriving in Malta, offering a dependable and cozy means of transportation for anyone wishing to travel between Malta and Sicily. All passengers will have a comfortable and delightful journey thanks to the JDLV's sophisticated facilities and services. In addition to outdoor decks with breathtaking views of the Mediterranean Sea, these include air-conditioned lounges, restaurants, bars, and restrooms. 
In order to secure a, the safety of all passengers and cargo, the vessel is also outfitted with cutting edge safety equipment and skilled crew members. The 13,600 horsepower engine. So far, the things we've mentioned are just applicable to regular sized machines and engines. But what if we were to tell you that it's the engine that needs to be built will power a modern ship that requires high horsepower and durability? Do you think things would change? Well, this 13,600 horsepower engine is one of the most powerful high-speed diesel engines in the world. This is also part of the MTU Series 8000 in Germany. It's already powered a lot of ships that have intense operations. Four of these 8000 engines are even used to power the Catamaran Ferry in Italy. With 20-cylinder Kamaman Rail diesel engines and 350-liter capacities per cylinder, the MTU Series 8000 is a potent and outstanding line of diesel engines that can generate 13,600 horsepower. These enormous engines are comparable in size to a steam locomotive, measuring roughly 7 meters in length, 2 meters in width, and 3.5 meters in height. They are quite enormous, yet they weigh only about 48 tons with the crankcase being the biggest and most important part. Around 2,000 liters of fuel are consumed per hour. The crankcase, or the central component of the engine, which plays an important role, is made and acquired from Germany. The place where they got this from has been an expert at dealing with this hot stuff for more than 600 years. In the casting of the crankcase for the Series 8000s, the smelting furnaces of this foundry needed to run at full capacity for around 10 hours. The steel workers are assigned to feed the furnace with different materials. For this project, it needed silicon carbide, electrode graphite, deep drawn sheet metal, and steel scrap pig iron. Engineers in the production planning department are responsible for the computations and compositions of these materials. A crankcase must be cast using 16 tons of material. This would be quite a difficult job for the smelters because they have to really keep an eye on the temperature. They need to make sure that it's kept on a constant until the molten metal reaches 1500 degrees. Once this is accomplished, the metal is then moved to the mold. Then its temperature will be recorded using a measuring sleeve that has a thermal element attached to a measuring probe. On the next parts, this is where other foundries get creative or innovative with their process. Through time, different companies have found out that addition of certain elements can actually help or affect the quality of a crankcase. This is why they try to add in more useful elements, but they need to do certain tests before doing this. First, they need to get a sample of the molten metal and pour it into the crucible. The temperature of this metal is recorded using the same instruments. Then the data will be transmitted to a computer where they can analyze the composition. In the next steps, they will no longer need to generate heat through fire because they can now use electricity. In this foundry, their electric induction furnaces have the power of 5,000 microwave ovens. This allows the heating of the metal for over 1500 degrees. While waiting for the desired temperature, they prepare the mold at just about 200 meters away. The last component, magnesium, is introduced using chutes after the smelt is periodically monitored. The crankcase becomes slightly elastic as magnesium vapor, which moves through mineral water like carbon dioxide does through molten metal, does. In this part, it's common to hear bubbles because it's the sound that partly comes from the magnesium vaporizing through the high temperature. Two enormous casting ladles that are loaded with a specific sand to prevent sand from contaminating the steel during casting receive the 19 tons of molten mass. Only two intake funnels are present on the mold, and to keep sand from combining with the steel, each intake funnel is coated with a foul odor. This odor is coming from the resin-soaked quartz that hardens a little layer. Days prior to the casting, this process necessitates absolute accuracy. Any mistake can make the molten metal useless. Then, a huge overhead gantry transports the cauldrons to the mold. This will now lead the birth of a mega diesel engine. In a mega diesel engine, two casting ladles are positioned over the filling funnels, and the head smelter starts the process. The molten metal flows into the funnels, and the mass settles before being removed. The head smelter then pulls the mass in, taking 70 seconds for 16 tons of metal to flood the mold and fill every cavity completely. The head smelter closely monitors the process, giving instructions to his colleagues to control the casting ladles faster. The metal cast in the mold will cool by several hundred degrees within a few hours, but it takes two weeks for the crankcase to peel from its mold. This process ensures the crankcase is hard, elastic, and durable. 
The smelters must repeatedly check the temperature of the molten mass since it's cooling minute by minute. If the temperature of the molten steel falls below 1400 degrees, the mass will no longer be appropriate for casting. The cauldrons are carried to the mold by a sizable overhead crane, and the molten metal must cool to a temperature of several hundred degrees before the crankcase can be removed from its cast. However, it will take the men two weeks to remove the crankcase from its molds. Only then will it be sufficiently strong, flexible, and hard. The hull of the high-speed ferry Jean de Lavette, destined for the silicon port of Port Salut, is home to four enormous diesel engines. At 1,150 revolutions per minute, these recoil-based water jet power plants provide 9.1 megawatts of power. Since this ship has 36.4 megawatts of electricity in total, losing an engine won't have a significant effect on how well it works. The 1,500-ton Jean de Lavette ferry is a very maneuverable and easy-to-handle craft. Its engine's immense power is necessary for berthing the ship. The ship is incredibly maneuverable and easy to steer, especially in tight spaces. The catamaran, which will arrive back in Malta in around 8 hours, has been staffed by a crew of marine engine experts. For one of the four mega diesel engines, two new cylinders are required, and the older ones require maintenance. Since they gotta start working right at once, the specialists descend to levels where the men are waiting. After two weeks, the experts enter the 50-degree engine room to find a loud auxiliary power unit and a 48-ton diesel engine waiting for them. Everyone understands that this requires doing a lot of work quickly. Consequently, brakes are not an option. After two weeks, the huge and elastic crankcase of the diesel engine will finally see the light of day. With the help of the overhead gantry, the 16-ton Colossus is lifted out of the casting pit to show the brand new Series 8000 crankcase. Cutting the two tie-down spruces, the first operation that welders are in charge of. The gas jet gradually pierces the tubes, which are as thick as tank armor. Other unneeded parts are still attached to the 7 meter long cast body. The expert welder has fully exposed the block after burning his way out of the crankcase piece by piece for an hour. The casting channel can be then taken out, however the material that was taken out is not lost. The overhead gantry then lifts the block to the subsequent station. An enormous mechanical vibrator knocks off any remaining quartz sand, which is then recycled after being cleaned. The big diesel's crankcase is generally free of debris. The shot blasting chamber will then blast the crankcase with a hail of tiny steel pellets. These steel pellets, which are made of ordinary steel and have a maximum diameter of 2.5 millimeters, can be used to forecast how the surface will seem and feel following. The men finish their work in about an hour and unlock the doors before removing a spotlessly clean engine block from the shot blasting chamber. The gigantic engines are built at the N2U plant at Fleet Lease, which typically specialize in large high-speed diesel engines. All across the world, MTU systems run trains, military vehicles, ships, and submarines. A Series 8000 naval engine requires six assembly sites, and 25 of these enormous diesel engines must leave the facility each year. To ensure that nothing bad could happen, while the engine is operating, engineers give the crankcase a unique serial number and measure each hole, square millimeter, and opening. The crankcase gets converted into an extra, extra large mega diesel engine over the course of the following five weeks. The liquid nitrogen is used to assemble the camshaft components by immersing thousands of microscopic guide pins in a nitrogen solution at a temperature of 198 degrees below zero. When the extremely cold guide pins warm up and expand to form a tight fit, it's simple to tap them into the camshaft segment's flange. The camshaft is then cautiously inserted into the 6 meter long duct, section by section, by the workman. A gigantic diesel engine is put together in multiple steps, beginning with a stage where the guide neck is inserted into the channel and the camshaft is bolted together. The surface hardened steel camshaft will not require replacement for the duration of the engine's life. After days of work, station one is finished, and an overhead gantry is used to move one of the 25 mega diesel engines that are produced each year to the following station. The largest engine part is the crankcase, followed in size by the enormous crankshaft, which is 6 meters long and weighs 6,000 kilograms. The engine must be turned upside down for the crankshaft installation, and the fitters must wheel the cage that is hanging from the overhead gantry. Six tons of high-grade metal are moving into the engine's innards every millimeter as the shaft goes in that direction to prevent irreparable harm. The challenging process is finished after 20 minutes, and the fitters tilt the massive frame one more degree for easier access to the engine's inlets. 
Then they installed 20 cylinder pistons, which are essentially independent single cylinder engines and have a 17 and a half liter capacity each. The pre-assembly location for the power units is also located in the workshop. The massive connecting rods must be measured, including measuring the bearing shells before assembly can start. To ensure accurate alignment, every measurement is precisely documented. The pistons, each weighing 100 kilos and having a diameter of 27 centimeters, are initially assembled by the fitters. Each con rod is carefully loaded into the piston and can only be moved with the crane. The first of 20 pistons is installed in a quarter of an hour. The intricate cylinder head on the rotary table is then the subject of attention. To ensure accuracy, the fitter inserts four bolts and fastens the cylinder liner with an additional 24 bolts. To ensure that no bolt has been overlooked and that every bolt has the appropriate torque, the procedure is entirely automated and monitored. One mistake could do significant harm because the piston and connecting rod are inserted slowly and carefully into the cylinder. Once the last parts and pieces have been put together, the engine block will be moved to Station 3 where a two-man crew will concentrate on the gear train. Up to 35 years of service are possible from the gear train and only trained professionals should perform maintenance. When the power unit needs to be removed from the engine, this is a key step. Only a hydraulic bolt tensioning cylinder can be used to release the nuts, which must be opened by the fitter since they enclose the crankshaft in the connecting rod's eye. Hoses are used to provide pressure of up to 1600 bars to ensure that all boats are loosened. The power unit is finally set free using only a pulley and their own muscle. A new engine for the fleet is being developed by the crew of the fast ferry Jean d'Alivette. The turbocharger group that is being installed in the engine is in charge of raising the combustion chamber's oxygen level. Each year, the marine diesel engine's performance is significantly improved thanks to the turbocharger which has thousands of individual parts. Every year, Tobias Hader assembles 25 of these turbochargers for Series 8000 engines, which significantly boosts the performance of the marine diesel engine. The turbocharger group is then moved to the Station 5 by an overhead gantry so that it can be mounted to the engine block there. The engine circuit is connected by two men, and the engine now weighs about 40 tons. The clutches are then flange mounted, and the fitters use specialized equipment to move the large component to the end of the crankshaft. To achieve a high oil pressure of 1500 bar, the cylinder with which the clutch flange will eventually be pushed to the back must expand. In order to prevent the clutch from disengaging when the powerful diesel engine starts up, the second portion of the clutch is now mounted above the enormous torque damper. The large engine is carried by the overhead gantry through the shop before being placed onto the oil pan of the gigantic diesel engine. The oil pan is filled to two-thirds of its maximum capacity, which is the volume pumped through the engine twice every minute, and the 40-ton compressor is safely supported on six stilts. A hydraulic hoist raises the sump with absolute accuracy so it can be mounted onto more. However, there is still a lot of work to be done. The catamaran's maintenance crew has a challenging task ahead of them because power units need to be replaced. Only six hours are given to the men to install the units. Through the service hatch, the new units, which has undergone a thorough overhaul, is lowered into the machine's room. The seven-person team, who are all experts trained for this engine series, uses a pulley to assist them as they carefully drop the 750kg component into the crankcase. The injector has to be cleaned, oiled, and have new seals installed in the cylinder head in order to be suitable for use. Additionally, the rocker arms and valves tolerances need to be corrected and each feeler gauge has a designated thickness that enables the technician to precisely adjust the valve clearance. The teams still have four hours to complete the second power unit replacement after the first one was changed. After being lowered into the machine room, the new power unit is then installed, fastened, lubricated, and adjusted. The crew is expecting the engine to start right away. At MTU on Lake Constance, the replacement engine block is once more being moved about the shop. Just prior to its final assembly station, the weight of the giant diesel engine has increased and is now close to 48 tons. The fitters are primarily concerned with the electronic system, pumps, and other lines at Station 6. The circulation system for fuel, oil, air, and exhaust gases in the Series 8000 marine diesel engine is intricate. 
With the development of a particularly big marine diesel engine built in Germany, work on the high-speed catamaran, the Jean de Levette, began. A water brake connected to the engine's transmission was used to assess performance as it was put through its paces on 46 test benches. The engine was put through its paces and proved to be the perfect in the Jean de Levette's hull after 30 minutes. A team of fitters had barely eight hours to repair the engine's core while waiting for another diesel engine of the same sort to pass its tests. The engines were then removed and put through a safety inspection before being put back together and returned into use. Following a final depth maneuver in the constrained basin, the Jean de Levette arrived in Malta with its engine operating flawlessly. Thanks to four German-made giant diesel engines that make up the majority of its power, this high-speed catamaran will be able to travel across the Mediterranean Sea three times per day, carrying vehicles, cargo, people, and tourists from Malta to Sicily and back in record time. The seven-meter-long Colossus, which is the world's biggest of its kind, was then moving toward the wash unit. It required five hours at 70 degrees, washed with soap and dried before being painted. After five hours, the engine was grease-free, immaculate, and necessary for upcoming paint spraying. Sensitive cables and pipes were kept clear of paint, which could alter their thermal and electrical qualities, and portions of the engine were covered in masking tape prior to paint spraying. It took 16 hours in the cabin to finish painting the engine. The Colossus was created in five weeks and could propel a ship for several years. With a 350-liter capacity and 13,000 horsepower, the Series 8000 Mega Diesel engine is powerful. It's available for delivery globally and ranges in price from 1 to 10 million euros. The Series 8000 Mega Diesel engine, which will power ships worldwide in the future, will usher in a new era of cutting-edge engineering. Beginning with the scrap metal, the smelters worked arduously to build the framework for one of the most effective naval engines in the world. That ends our video on how this 13,600 horsepower engine was built. We appreciate your company while we explore the world of engines and ships. We hope you found this video informative and entertaining. And remember to hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. Until next time, stay tuned for more amazing tools and construction equipment that will leave you in awe. Thanks for watching!